Good afternoon and a uh, very warm welcome to the Oxford Martin School. I'm Ian Golden. I'm the director of the school. Uh, it's an enormous pleasure this evening to be having a discussion on demography and human capital. And I'm particularly delighted that Sir Andrew Dilnot, the warden of Nuffield College, has agreed to chair this, as this is very much his area of knowledge uh, and expertise. Uh, Andrew, as you may well know, has done popular programs uh, on the radio and in elsewhere on the meaning of statistics. Uh, he's also the chairperson of the UK Statistics Authority. Uh, he was previously the head of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and prior, and following that, the warden of St. Hugh's College uh, in Oxford and also the chairperson of what everyone simply knows as the Dilnot Commission, which was the UK Commission into the funding of support and care. So I'm absolutely delighted that Sir Andrew has agreed uh, to take the chair this evening, and I welcome him to the podium. Thank you, Ian. It's always a delight to be here in the Martin School. I'm, uh, I'm very excited by this evening. There aren't many bigger or more important trends going on in the world than the trends in population and the way in which education and the development of uh, human capital is integrated into that. We're extraordinarily lucky to have Wolfgang here with us this evening. There has been, a, I, I think, a much less serious um, launch of some of this some, in some other city in the world that Wolfgang might relate to. But this, is, this is the really serious engagement with the launch of this work. It's a very, very important piece of work. Wolfgang, uh, known to many of you here, founding director of the Wittgenstein Center for Demography and Global Human Capital, program director at the World Population Program for IASA, and crucially, one of the editors, well, I'm sure he'd be himself the first person to say, not the sole creator of, but one of the binding forces behind world population and human capital in the 21st century, which I'm reliably informed has 1,056 pages, and we're going to hear the crucial central elements of all 1,056. Before going over to you. Thank you very much for the kind words, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. I'm delighted that you join us here in the, in the launching of this big, voluminous, heavy book that really summarizes uh, more than three years of work. And it's going to be a real challenge in 20 minutes to summarize uh, what is in these 1,056 pages. You have a summary of 66 pages, the executive report on your uh, chairs, and this can also be downloaded free of charge from uh, the website. So I encourage you to have a, a closer look. But there are also flyers where you can purchase the book uh, with a 30% discount. Now, the Wittgenstein Center that has been mentioned already is a collaboration among these three institutions in the Vienna area, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, the Vienna Institute of Demography of the Austrian Academy, and the University of Economics in Vienna. You may wonder about the name. Yes, it is indirectly uh, pointing to the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein because it's the Wittgenstein Prize that is the, Austria, the highest Austrian science prize. And it was this prize in 2010 that allowed me to establish this new institute as a collaboration of these uh, three groups. So uh, I will only focus on two quite unique uh, new features of the book. The first is that it gives the most comprehensive scientific assessment of what we know today about the drivers of fertility, mortality, migration, and also to some extent education in all countries of the world for the coming decades. And what is the basis for this? Well, it is first of all a state-of-the-art review uh, that includes 26 uh, lead authors for six chapters that really try to summarize what is in the literature, and then also a large number of contributing authors. We took this model from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, where you also have contributing authors that only sort of contribute their knowledge on rather specific topics. On top of this, uh, we had sent a questionnaire to all members of international population associations and uh, received 550 answers about uh, a number of arguments 
and I will tell you later why it is uh, assessing scientific arguments in a peer-reviewed manner is what we think is a good way to collect expert wisdom, expert knowledge, expert experience. And finally, we had five meetings of what we call meta-experts, or that we are synthesizing experts that took place on five uh, continents and also with large numbers of participants. I should point out that the three important lead authors are here in the audience uh, today. There are, of course, many other people here in the audience I see who uh, contributed in one way or the other to the project. But I'd just like to point at uh, Anne Goujon, maybe you can identify yourself here. She is the lead author of the high fertility chapter and also head of the data lab. So whenever you have questions to the data, I will pass it on to Anne. Uh, then there's Bilal Barakat. Um, he is the lead author of the education chapter. Actually, he has a doctorate here in education planning from Oxford, so he, he should know what he's doing. And uh, then the third is Stuart Baston. Stuart, where are you? Yes, you're here. Uh, he is working actually in the social policy department here at Oxford and uh, is the lead author of the low fertility chapter. There's a question like how low can fertility, particularly in East Asia, fall? Well, let's step back to some theoretical consideration. Uh, what can we meaningfully say about the future? Because there's nothing we know for certain about the future. And essentially, there are two different philosophies of doing projections or forecasting, if you want. The one is more model-based, so you have a statistical model, and the other relies more on expert knowledge. And as you may have seen, the United Nations have recently published a new set of population projections that are somewhat higher than the ones that we present here, which is very much on a model-based approach, and ours is more an expert-based approach. And there are, of course, many statistical extrapolation models, uh, some very simple ones, other like the one used by the UN, uh, a very complex uh, Bayesian models, but that they essentially they use past time series data plus some specific model assumptions and then just run the projections in a probabilistic manner uh, for the rest of the century. Uh, when you rely on experts, this has in the past been relatively unsophisticated. Most statistical agency, including, by the way, the United Nations until a few years ago, uh, in-house made up some plausible intuitive assumptions about the future trajectory of fertility or mortality or migration. Then in the literature on expert knowledge, there have been quite some developments in the field of what is called Delphi approaches with interaction and feedback and so on. We ourselves at YASA had started already 20 years ago in our 94 book that was entitled The Future Population of the World, What Can We Assume Today? We aimed at uh, really using half of the book at least for substantive justification of the assumptions. But this again was by invited individual expert. It was not a big assembly of expert views. And that's why we recently in this newest assessment uh, moved uh, to a much larger number of experts to involve and also sort of go deeper uh, in letting these experts uh, review in a peer review type manner uh, some of the alternative substantive arguments that then impact on the future trend in fertility, mortality and migration. And then of course there's also the question, do you go probabilistically and as you may know we have done uh, several rounds of probabilistic world population projections in the past that were published in the pages of Nature in 96. It was entitled Doubling of World Population Unlikely, and in 2001, the title The End of World Population Growth. But here we are now moving back to sort of probability-free if-then scenarios, partly because we add on another dimension of complexity, namely being education-specific. Okay, what we're trying to do here is really blending a statistical modeling and we do sort of UN type forecasting models as well with, we plan this with a structured expert assessments. Just to give you a flavor of what this looks like and some of you may have spent quite some time trying to fill out this questionnaire. Here you see one of these 150 arguments and this has to do for instance with the future of biomedical technology. So the argument is that increased understanding of biomedical aging processes will allow us to develop effective anti-aging strategies. And then you can judge as an expert whether you think that this is likely to be wrong, you're ambivalent, or it's likely to be right. 
Uh, but then we need a second question, uh, whether in case that it is right, whether it would matter for the future of life expectancy. And that is the second question, whether in this case it would either lead to strongly decreasing, uh, no or strongly increasing effect on uh, life expectancy. And then you multiply these two scores and then you get a total score that whether experts think that this argument is indeed a major driver of future mortality decline or not. Now, the second unique feature of this set is that we are adding education to age and sex. Uh, we, this is the first set of consistent projections uh, by age, sex, and level of education for almost all countries in the world and for the rest of the 21st century. Uh, you may know that uh, up until the middle of last century, most population projections were simply carried out by applying a population growth rate to the population size. So this is the most simple way of population forecasting. And this is still mostly done in animal demography, for instance, or uh, other non-human uh, projection fields. Now, uh, in the first decades of the 20th century, the age structures became very irregular. Fertility had declined, and there were World War I and then World War II. So demographers understood that it is safer, and there is this age heterogeneity that matters greatly. So they developed projections by age and sex, the so-called cohort component model. And now we believe it is time to yet add another important source of population heterogeneity, namely educational attainment, to standard demographic analysis and standard uh, population projections. And the reason is that because, as we know, population heterogeneity matters greatly uh, for population dynamics. And in particular, since this is observable heterogeneity, there's also kind, all kinds of unobserved heterogeneity that, that we can do less about. And it's universally more educated women have fewer children, have lower child mortality, and more educated adults live longer. But it's not only this heterogeneity that matters, it's also the fact that we are interested in education itself. It is a crucial determinant both of the individual empowerment and of what we call the human capital in society. It is a key driver of socioeconomic development, as influences public health, economic growth, up to the quality of institutions and even democracy has been shown. And finally, something that I've recently worked as well on adaptive capacity to climate change. Now, illustrating this, this is my favorite graph, as you may recognize the age pyramid. Uh, that has women to the right, men to the left, sorted by age. And now we added color here. Red means no education, never seen a school from inside. Yellow means some primary education. Light blue means uh, at least completed junior secondary. And dark blue means post-secondary tertiary education. So this is an example of Singapore in 1985. Uh, this was the first time I, I visited Singapore and I was struck by a divided society. The young people in Singapore in 85 were like Europeans. They were well educated. They spoke all English. But then when you went around the corner, you saw a second Singapore. They only spoke Chinese. They were much poorer. They did not interact, did not use uh, the computers and so on. And this is uh, not, this is quite important because this is a sort of a two classes but not the conventional classes that are self-reproducing, but these are sort of cohort-specific classes. It is the old Singaporeans versus the young Singaporeans. And we see what happens there when we go back to 1970, and for all countries in the world, we've reconstructed these pyramids also to 1970. Uh, we, can't, we don't have the data beyond 1970, but in the 1950s, Singapore was a very poor developing country with almost no education. And then you see education has started for the younger cohorts, but still above the age of 40, all the women essentially and the large proportion of the men were without any formal education. And now we saw an animation, this is 1980, 1990, 2000. And now you see what we also call demographic metabolism. It is how societies change through generational replacement. The young, better educated cohorts come from the bottom and move up the age pyramid and the older, less educated cohorts die off. This is Singapore 2010, 2020, and 2030, some projections. Why, what you also see here, of course, is that more educated women have fewer children, and the Singaporean population is aging tremendously. 
And that's another question that we are dealing with, not so much in the book, but in, in other contexts, that uh, are there negative economic consequences or can the, the higher productivity of these better educated young people compensate for their smaller number? Okay, now uh, let's move to the most rapidly growing continent, uh, Kenya. Uh, this is what we uh, sort of uh, empirically observed for the starting year in 2010 are the educational fertility differences. You see uh, that uh, no women with no education in Kenya still have on average more than six children. But if the women have already uh, post-secondary education or even upper secondary education, they are below three or two and a half. And then, of course, we have to make assumptions how these educational fertility differentials will evolve in the future. And uh, there are some substantive considerations in here because they're both maybe spillover effects from the more educated, where the behavior is imitated by the less educated, but you have, may have a counteracting selectivity effect that in a society where very few people are without education, they may be more extreme than in a society where there are many without education. So in any case, the green line that you see, that's the overall total fertility rate. And as you see under these assumptions of educational improvement, now the green line is still higher, it's still above four there with the less educated, but over time when more women in Kenya will move to the higher education categories, it comes uh, to the closer to the, less, uh, to the lower fertility of the more educated. Now, uh, the whole uh, sort of methodological conception of this was published a couple of years ago in a review article in Science Magazine. They had a special issue focusing on population. And there we show some model calculations where we take the identical education-specific uh, fertility pattern, like the pattern I've just showed you for Kenya, and apply it to two extreme education scenarios. So this is the constant enrollment numbers scenario that assumes essentially no new schools are being built. No further progress in involving people in schooling. And you see that uh, actually the uneducated population, the red one, expands over time, uh, partly because the population is growing in Africa and no schools are built there. Uh, and the world population will increase to 10 billion already by the middle of the century. Now the other extreme, the fast track scenario, assumes that the education expansion is as rapid as we have seen for Singapore or South Korea was similar. So you see a massive increase in the more educated population. And given the same education specific fertility rates, we have a world population that is less than 9 billion. So education alone under these scenarios accounts for more than a billion people difference in world population by the middle of the century. Well, uh, but in order to make these assumptions, we need to be certain that education uh, has a real causal role in this, that it's not just a spurious association. So in the book, we have a whole chapter, uh, chapter two, dedicated uh, to discussing this matter, and we introduce this, fun this notion of functional causality. Uh, that means that at least for the purpose of these uh, forecasts for these projections, it is safe to assume a stable association uh, between lower fertility and higher education of women. So education in that sense is not just a proxy for socioeconomic status as is often seen in the social sciences, but there is a real mechanism. And in, doing, in describing this, we really go back to physiology and neurology. And uh, uh, you may know the Vienna-born uh, Eric Kandel, who is now a Columbia professor in the year 2000, got the Nobel Prize in medicine and uh, physiology for his work on the human memory, on the human brain. And he often concludes his uh, lectures with a saying that, now let's repeat this point for a third time. Now the synaptic structure of your brains is different for the rest of your life. And when you walk out this door, you are physiologically a different person than when you entered the room. So there is something real going on in learning. That is the main point. That comes along with enhancement of cognitive skills that uh, tend to change risky behavior, extend the personal planning horizon, and very importantly, uh, a faster learning curve in learning from past damage. And we, ex we collected a lot of evidence in this book on natural experiments and other uh, studies that really make a strong case that this is a true causal effect. 
And then, of course, more education gives you better access to the relevant information. Uh, it improves your health and your physical well-being. And last but not least, also higher income is often a consequence of better education. And it helps you to, to purchase goods that are good for your survival, for instance. Now, in the last section, I now want to focus on some scenarios. Be very selective. And uh, this, uh, as a fortunate coincidence, I should say, happened our development of these scenarios at the same time that the international climate change modeling community was uh, looking for a new set of scenarios. As you may know, in 2000, actually also by a group led by YASA's energy program, uh, the IPCC stress scenarios were developed that for the last uh, one and a half decades have really dominated the field. But they were rather simplistic on the population size. They only had two socioeconomic variables, social variables, I should say. It's total population size, that's one, and then GDP on the other hand. And population so essentially served the role of a denominator for per capita uh, energy consumption and so on. Uh, but now uh, the community wanted to be more sophisticated on the, the social development side, in particular because these scenarios should now jointly address the socioeconomic challenges associated with climate change mitigation, so reducing our emissions, and adaptation, I mean, adapting to already unavoidable climate change. And here, of course, more socially developed societies are better able to adapt to climate change. So we developed uh, these projections as what I sometimes call the human core, by age, sex, and level of education, of this broader SSP that also includes uh, economic, technological, and many other variables. So this is SSP2, which is the middle of the road scenario that sort of combines what from today's perspective looks as the most plausible uh, future trajectories of fertility, mortality, migration, and education. And you see uh, the same colors as before, and the world population is still increasing up uh, to around uh, 2065, 2070, when we are projecting a peak of around 9.4 billion with a mild decline. And what's underlying this is uh, in part this massive improvement of the educational composition of the world population. SSP1 is the, the most rapid social development scenario. It's also sometimes called the sustainability scenario where your education expansion is much more rapid, also health improvements are more rapid. And here you see a uh, more blue area uh, already uh, by the middle of the century. You see a faster uh, decline of the completely uneducated population. And you see an earlier peaking already at about eight and a half billion people by the middle of the century. Where the opposite is the SSP3. This is a stalled development uh, where there is not much progress in education, and you see the proportions, different levels of education essentially stay the same, and the world population as a whole is increasing to more than 12 uh, billion by the end of the century. Of course, there are many more specific uh, sub-scenarios, and we have these scenarios for all individual countries, but at the global level, these three SSP sort of show you the range uh, of what has been uh, modeled and projected here. There is a very important age structure component here. So to the left, you see the world population age pyramid and education pyramid in 2010. It still looks like a pyramid. Uh, you see the red area pretty much uh, corresponds to uh, what Paul Collier here in Oxford uh, calls the bottom billion. It's the poorest, but also the least educated. And then you have the two opposing scenarios, the SSP1 and the SSP3. Uh, for the world in 2050, and you see in the most rapid social development scenario, at least the younger population would resemble pretty much what we have in Europe today, a rather well-educated, uh, somewhat aging population, and the SSP3 will have a continued very high population growth, a very young population, with unfortunately increasing number of uneducated people also in the younger ages. Many other institutions have produced uh, population projections over the coming years. Actually, for the end of the century, it's only the UN and us. But if we uh, go uh, to 2050, there have been other sets of projections. And I just wanted to point that our, it's called the Vic for Wittgenstein Center 2013, the Violet 
a bold line. It's pretty much in the middle. Uh, the, the most recent UN projections are a bit higher, but there are some earlier UN projections and also uh, projections by the Club of Rome uh, produced two years ago that are much lower. Now, uh, this all has, of course, uh, policy implications. So in the uh, epilogue of the book, I write a bit uh, under the title, With Education, the Future Looks Different. And they describe in different respects, it does indeed look different. And then there has recently been another paper in Population and Development Review in the September issue now uh, that draws conclusions for a 21st century population policy rationale. How should we think about population policies once we've now sort of digested that education is a key element of all of this? And this policy focus really could be called a national human resource management for sustainable development. So it includes a focus on universal primary and secondary education. That's important that our study showed it's not enough to focus on universal primary, but also secondary education. And fortunately, the draft for the new sustainable development goals also explicitly mentions universal secondary education. And of course, basic health is also a key element of human capital. And the nice thing about this, these are not separate policies for the poor and the rich countries, but these are valid for all countries of the world, for aging countries and for rapidly growing countries. And it is fully consistent with human rights. You may be familiar with the discussion around Cairo 94, or whether there can be demographic targets or only human rights. This focusing on education and seeing this positive consequence of education is, is very consistent with a human rights perspective. And as I said, it's at the heart of the Millennium Development Goals and of the SDGs likely to be um, decided upon uh, September next year. And more even a specific focus on female education is suggested. To empower women within family and society to exercise their reproductive rights, Typically, more educated women want fewer children and find ways to have fewer children. And this will help to moderate rapid population growth in high fertility countries, as we already said. It will contribute to poverty reduction and economic growth, and several papers have pointed at this. Uh, it will also increase uh, female labor force participation and productivity. This is also more relevant for our European aging uh, countries where it's very clear that more educated women have a higher labor force participation and tend to retire later. And uh, it also contributes to the quality of institutions and democracy. Well, I will end here, just if you want to capture this whole message of the book in, in one nutshell, you can say that we should move beyond a head counts and understanding that what really counts is what is inside the heads. Thank you very much. Can I ask the panel members to come and join me up at the front here? So, Sarah, come and sit here, Francesco, David. Um, you can tell that uh, Wolfgang has been trained in many, many ways, including as a statistician, because he spoke for exactly the amount of time he was meant to speak for, which is, I'm afraid, rare in this university, but extremely appreciate, as was the content of what you said. So we've now got about 20 minutes for responses from members of the panel. Well, the guy's a member of the panel, but I'm not going to let him speak until the other three have spoken. I give him a chance to draw breath. I'll introduce the three members of the panel as we, as we go along. I'm going to start by asking Sarah Harper, who's on my immediate left, uh, to speak. Sarah, long-standing interest in and expertise in this area co-founder of the Oxford Center for Oxford Institute for Population Aging, uh, which associated itself with the Martin School, has been for a long time, professor of gerontology here and one of uh, the world's leading experts, particularly on aging, but having come at it very much from some demographic perspective. So Sarah. No, thank, th thank you very much. Um, and it's fantastic uh, to have Wolfgang uh, talk about uh, this work, and, and we at Oxford were delighted to be involved in some of the ideas uh, around some of the ageing uh, debate, and I know my other colleagues uh, worked with him on fertility and migration. Um, I, I, as uh, Andrew said, work, uh, my institute works on age compositional change, and I would say that one of the key messages that comes out of Wolfgang's 
uh, work is around education uh, and the importance of education uh, in really transforming the demographic structure uh, of many countries. So what I wanted to do was just highlight uh, four main issues that I think from uh, the perspective of this age compositional change of the world uh, has really um, been enhanced by Wolfgang's work. Number one, when, you say, when we say we work on aging uh, and then we say we're interested in falling fertility, people look at us, but in fact, falling fertility uh, is one of the big drivers of, of the aging uh, of the population. Uh, as women have fewer children, the total fertility rate in countries goes down, so the average age of the population goes up and populations uh, start to age. Uh, another really big factor uh, is around um, the, the relationship between uh, this age change in the uh, population composition and actual population size. Uh, and I think one of the things, uh, particularly those people who are concerned about population growth, sometimes don't quite understand is that if you look at the projections going forward, particularly between here and 2050, um, we are seeing falls in the total fertility rate in many parts of the world, and I know uh, my colleague's going to talk about that. But as we see a fall, for example, in the total fertility rate in some of the Asian countries, we still see high levels of fertility in Africa. But in a way, they are beginning to balance each other out. And one of the big drivers of increase in population is actually falling mortality. And as we see the changing uh, pyramid shape, uh, we have to understand that whereas in the past we would have large uh, percentages of a country's uh, children and young adults die, not just the older adults, so these adults are living longer, and it is the falling in mortality that is contributing uh, to population growth at the moment. But I think the three issues that I'd like to raise for discussion um, all relate back to the relationship of population and education. Number one, I think, is around the demographic dividend. And there is a big debate at the moment around the conversion of the world's labor pools into what we call a demographic dividend. In other words, though we may have young people uh, coming up to uh, a, a working age, can we convert that labor pool into a demographic dividend? And there is a big debate at the moment uh, between China and India. Uh, if you look at the statistics, around about 2030, the labor pool in China starts to fall and the labor pool in India starts to uh, increase and take over. There will be more, there will be a higher labor pool in India than China, but it is not clear that we will see a shift in the demographic dividend and this power in economic uh, and political might going from China to India may not occur, and a lot of that is going to be around the education capacity of those countries. Also things around institutions, governance and health, but education is clearly very important there. I think another really big issue is around life expectancy, and, and one of the things that Wolfgang talked about obviously was increasing life expectancy, very clear from the pyramids that he put up, but the really big question is going to be the relationship between life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. In an ideal world, as we extend life expectancy of populations, we really want the healthy life expectancy to increase. In other words, we want to push back the onset of frailty and morbidity uh, so that we live in health throughout our lives. Now, that is, is very much, uh, at the moment, beyond uh, uh, what we uh, see, but we are seeing uh, a, a, um, um, a coming together of the onset uh, of uh, disability. So we're coming together of healthy life expectancy and life expectancy. In other words, we're pushing back the onset of frailty and disability. And a lot of that is to do with the education of the population uh, coming through. And if we can do that, then the aging of the population to a certain extent becomes less of a challenge because clearly we can have active, healthy, contributing adults in their 60s, 70s, and even maybe 80s contributing to our societies in good health, and therefore the chronological increase in age becomes less relevant. But again, education will play a role there. And then, of course, there's a really big question that we uh, work at in particularly, which is increases in longevity. How long are we really going to see these increases continue? Uh, other colleagues uh, from the Max Planck Institute, for example, uh, have suggested that the real life expectancies uh, of babies being born at the Europe today are around 104, 105, 107 uh, in Japan. Uh, and as a consequence, the big question is, we're going to see, we know, large numbers of centenarians in advanced economies. 
Uh, are we going to see increases in supercentenarians? Are we going to see uh, that curve come out so that as we get more people live to over 100, so we're going to get li more people living to 115, 120? The evidence from Japan at the moment, where they have uh, statistically large numbers uh, of uh, people over 100, is that yes, we may well do. Uh, and again, the education of that population coming through is going to be crucial uh, in things like dementia, because we know there is a relationship between dementia and education. We're not quite sure which way it works, but definitely those people with a higher level of education either don't get dementia or they're able to hide it. So again, I think the work that Wolfgang has done really across his life has to been really in state the role of education into demography, uh, and this is a wonderful example of that. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, let me pass now straight to Francesco next. Francesco, head of the sociology department here in Oxford, a professor of sociology and demography and a fellow at Nuffield College. Francesco. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thanks for having me here. I I'm delighted to, uh, to see the way Bolton presented the book. I haven't had yet the opportunity to finish the thousand pages. But I, I, I like to make some points that I hope are useful for our discussion. Uh, the idea of going beyond headcounts is, uh, is simply a great idea, and that was one of the key problems of people looking at demography. So demography is, is not just about numbers, number of people. There, was a, there were big mistakes also in terms of policy decisions when we saw population just by the sheer number. The expansion towards looking at the age structure and age and sex structure of population was certainly welcome. And now the, this uh, book advocates, and, and the other work at uh, the Bitcoin Science Center, advocates the use of education. I think this is very welcome, although it comes with challenges. Uh, when we had uh, people, age and sex, we were strongly rooted at what we call the macro level. So individual decision making was not very much part of the picture. Once we start putting education in, uh, even if I understand one of, the, uh, one of the policy implications of the book is trying to make education as kind of available to everyone and just care about the compulsory bits. We are, we are inserting people decisions, so the decision to continue education, to choose the type of education, and the decisions that educated people make in terms of influencing uh, our societies. I'll go back to, to this uh, potential influence of educated people on demography uh, back. But what is very important is to understand that uh, what goes on even at the world population level starts with uh, also with individual decisions and with couple deciding the number of kids and it's very fortunate that this has been uh, the road taken also by by the Wittgenstein Center uh, I'd like to make a second point and it's about uncertainty um, the presentation emphasized different scenario. And I was, uh, I was uh, going to say that before demographers were trying to emphasize their ad uh, competitive advantage, they knew the future better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And this has been problematic also because demographers haven't been living up to expectations. And it's very, very important that uh, the, the scenarios emphasize that the future is uncertain. It is uncertain. And there are several ways through which uh, we could see uncertainty. In, in the book, there is uh, expert driven, uh, there are expert driven scenarios. And I, I've also participated to one of the expert meetings. Uh, there, the link between the expert uh, scenarios and uh, the actual uh, projections is not fully formalized, but it gives us a bit of flavor uh, of the uncertainty involved. Where uncertainty is very important, I mean, there, there are two sources. One is what, what we may call now casting. There are some uh, places in the world where we don't know where we are today. 
I'm afraid this may involve the largest uh, demographic uh, weight in the world, China. We are, we are not 100% sure of the current situation, so already what is called now casting uh, brings uncertainty in the picture. Uh, but every time we go to the national level, there is a big uncertainty. And I'm afraid this should be uh, every time um, emphasized. And uh, I'm happy that in the book there are different scenarios. At the national level, the future of the population is uncertain. Even if demographers know that people who are uh, 20 years old, old now may become 40 years old in 20 years. If you, if you look at the national level, there is something called migration. And migration is inducing quick uncertainty and uh, massive changes in the population. And uh, if we follow the debate, uh, for instance, in this country, we are aware that uh, forecasting uh, the population, in, even in the short term, may be misleading if we don't take into account migration uh, and the uncertainty around migration. And this involves also the role of migration in shaping responses to uh, population aging. So for a while, uh, demographers and others uh, have popularized the idea that migration had no effect whatsoever on population aging. That's officially wrong. So migration can slow the rate of aging, can solve some of the imbalances in the short term. We just have to take that into account. Of course, in the long term, as Sarah pointed out, there is what we call global aging as a consequence of low fertility and uh, high increasing life expectancy, the world will become a, a kind of a more elderly place. But at the national level, migration can change the picture quickly. Uh, my final point is about policies and how, let's say, how educated people are able also to shape the destiny of our societies. I start from my main field, fertility. So infertility, we observe very recently uh, a reversal of the traditional uh, relationship between development and fertility. So in very rich societies now, fertility tends to be positively associated with development. And how could this happen? Be basically because educated individuals were contributing to shaping policies and policies that help uh, combining work and family were developed in advanced societies. So education is also important because educated people are uh, able to influence policies. Policies then change demography. And so in a sense, every time we see uh, a population projection, if we leave the room, we can go and think about uh, policy implications. And we, if we implement the policy uh, measures, then we may just change the scenario. Uh, so basically, educated people are very important. And I cannot uh, agree less with this. Uh, my very last point, there is a, a relationship between the components of demographic change. Uh, good old Malthus, if I may pronounce uh, his name. So uh, one of the first demographers around had the idea that there was a homeostasis. So some of the relationship in population were uh, such that, that there were offsetting effects. And the, the main effect uh, that he, he was thinking was that uh, when mortality is high, we tend to have many kids in order to have them survive through reproductive age. So this is certainly going on uh, today. Uh, the other type of uh, homeostasis that is relevant, if we think about uh, projections, is a, a relationship between migration and population growth. So in countries where population growth is going to be high, it is very likely that there would be pressure to out-migrate. In countries where population growth would be low, it is likely that there may be policy pressures to get uh, people in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesca. And now let me turn to David Coleman. David Coleman, who I think deserves an enormous amount of credit for keeping demography going. 
in this country. There have been periods when there haven't been very many people in the academy taking demography seriously. David has always been doing that. I think of David as being the doyen of that work, uh, also uh, a, a model for academics in the way that he's done not just academic work, but has been engaged in policy debates throughout that period. David. Thank you, Andrew, very much. Mere survival has its merits, perhaps. Um, <laughs> first of all, I must congratulate Wolfgang and all his uh, collaborators for this, this stupendous piece of work, um, which discussion on which will, will run and run, I'm quite certain. Um, all I've managed to do is read this uh, reassuringly expensive looking executive summary. Um, I've not seen the even more reassuringly expensive book, nonetheless. I have extracted several questions. Um, error, women, conflict, Africa, diversity, migration, puzzles in Europe, um, which, to which I'm, in, uh, I, I'm rationed to 30 seconds each, so I shan't be able to talk about all of them. Um, the first thing which, which struck me, and I hope uh, it, it's not too uh, uh, critical, um, is, is to wonder just how good experts are. Um, <laughs> Wolfgang has shown us that a combination of expert-based and model-based projection is superior to either. What I would like to know is what yet is the evidence for that? These projections based on these sources have only been going for a short time. And is there empirical evidence to show whether one is better than the other or whether experts really know any better than anybody else? Experts, after all, are subject uh, to the whims of fashion. Um, about 15 years ago, there was a great fashion for cohort projections of fertility, uh, which showed how impossible it was uh, for birth rates to recover by, by more than a small amount. Um, the birth rates in Europe have recovered, parche the recent recession, uh, to a level not far below the level of replacement. Furthermore, um, I would suggest uh, that there is no sound barrier in reproduction um, and that the, the, the widely uh, believed impossibility for birth rates to achieve a replacement rate of 2.1 in developed societies may well be wrong. Uh, clearly, it can't exceed that for very long, uh, otherwise it will all starve to death. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I, I think the future may give us uh, some surprises, uh, as uh, and indeed Francesco was, was suggesting. Um, as, as far as education is concerned, um, another unpleasant little question is whether the introduction of, of education into population projections, obviously very welcome, very wise, very sensible, doesn't also introduce yet another element of, of, uh, of uncertainty. So you're compounding uncertainty, which already arises from the birth rate and the death rate, by introducing this, this new major uh, element and increasing, therefore, perhaps the fuzziness of projections, increasing their spread, um, and, and in some respects, uh, making them all a bit more diverse and a bit less, less useful, potentially speaking, given that education projections are just as likely to be inaccurate as anything else. On women, um, is it really true that women who have more education uh, don't have or don't want uh, uh, um, uh, as many children? It's certainly true uh, in most of the poorer countries. I'm not at all sure that it's necessarily true um, in the richer countries, where certainly when you look at uh, the level of prestige and income, there's a J-shaped curve in relation to, to uh, desired and, and achieved fertility, um, which, which uh, is really what ought to be the case in, in terms of uh, conventional economic thinking. That you know, if you have more money, um, which goes with education, uh, then you have more of everything. You have more cars, you have a bigger swimming pool, you have a bigger house. Uh, and given there's some curious desire to have children, which we can't yet explain, you'll have more children as well. Um, the, there's an interesting conflict going on with the new United Nations projection, which I, 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 Wolfgang mentioned, and, and I, won't, I won't elaborate on because um, it, it's going to be a very interesting fight uh, coming up in, in future international meetings. But it is very interesting how, how different bodies of very talented, very clever, very well-informed people do come up with slightly different views about what the future is, is going to be. I wonder if the, these very interesting cyber, uh, scenarios which Wolfgang and his colleagues have devised um, might not also include a, a, a failure scenario. Uh, if you look around the world at the moment, 
Um, education is really taking a clobbering in some parts of the world. Um, it's taking a clobbering in a great part of the Middle East, m much of which is in chaos. And I can't imagine that very much advanced schooling is going on in great areas of Iraq uh, and, and, uh, and Syria uh, and Libya just at the present time. Uh, and with the rise of ISIS, uh, that, that looks as though it may become well established for, for, for a long time. And that has its clones or its, its, its uh, uh, parallel organizations in the form of Boko Haram in northern Nigeria, which has influence outside Nigeria as well to the, to the north. Um, uh, if this becomes established, then you may be in for a, a bit of a dark age in terms of education, which may um, really stall uh, uh, education progress and therefore all the good things which Volkang shows uh, emanate from that. Um, and that in turn makes me wonder whether rather more diversity might be called for in the scenarios which Wolfgang has, has spoken of. I may have misread the, the, um, the, the paper here, but I had the impression that his uh, shared socioeconomic pathways, um, that they, these, these apply to all regions at once. You either were in, in, in one uh, SSP or another one or, or, or the third one, and th those applied generally uh, to all the regions of the world. Um, if um, my fear is, is correct that some parts of the world are, are going to get stuck or go backwards in a very serious way, then it may be that one needs a diversity of these, uh, these scenarios uh, with di different scenarios applying to different <coughs> regions of the world, which will make the projections much more messy, but possibly uh, much more, um, much more uh, realistic. Um, I also like to talk to, 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 to move to Europe. I wasn't quite clear what the future of Europe is envisaged to be, but, uh, and I wonder if, if, if the experts are taking into account some of the institutional handicaps uh, which seem to be affecting some of the European countries, now uh, allegedly about to lurch into their third uh, series of, of, of recessions in a row, um, and to some extent imprisoned by their culture in, in some uh, regions of Europe. Um, with, with, um, with, with the European social model um, keeping employment protected, keeping youth unemployment very high, even without uh, the economic crisis, um, stuck with, uh, uh, if I may be allowed to say so, a common currency from which they cannot escape and which appears to be likely to, uh, to, to keep important parts of Europe in a, in a permanent position of, of difficulty. Unless Europe can escape for that, it may get stuck uh, in, uh, certainly on mainland Europe, in, in a, low, a low fertility scenario which may have really quite serious effects upon its aging and upon its population quite independently from anything to do with, with uh, the, the growth of education which could, uh, could, could proceed in, in parallel. So some conflicting processes um, may be going on there which uh, experts might perhaps have thought of whether they've incorporated those uh, into their thinking and their decisions. I'm really uh, not quite sure. Well, that's, I, I think, probably uh, enough questions from me. So perhaps not having used up all my five minutes, I will stop. Thank you very much, David. Um, I think we should let Wolfgang say anything briefly respond to any of the points that have been raised that he'd like to respond to. And while that's going on, pay attention to what Wolfgang's saying, but also think about what you want to say, because I'll be coming to you all next. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very rich and informed uh, comments. Um, I take the liberty of just picking one point per person uh, to respond. Uh, when Sarah referred to the uh, demographic dividend, it is indeed a rather complex issue uh, that uh, very, uh, the simplistic versions of the demographic dividend uh, said take sort of fixed age structure, said be below the age of 15, a person is only a burden, and after the age of 15, no matter whether he or she is in education or works or whatever, is sort of on the positive side, is an asset, and then at 65, the curtain goes down again, and everybody above age 65 is liability. And, uh, but there, of course, we have to look at actual economic dependency ratio. When are people working? And this very much depends on the length of education at the young end and also the age of retirement. And, uh, and of course, the productivity and the economic implications also depend on the education structure. So actually, in the journal Demography, about a year ago, we published an article with the title, Is the Demographic Dividend an Education Dividend? where we sort of systematically added the education variables to these economic growth regressions that are the foundations of the demographic dividend model. And indeed, it turns out that education is the key uh, driver of this. And uh, of course, um, it is true that uh, if a society has a lower fertility, then there is an opportunity also for women to join the workforce. So they all 
it's it's part of the socio-economic development, but it needs to be looked in a more sophisticated, more differentiated manner than simply what I see over and over again in demographic conferences, people plotting simply the overall total dependency ratio with fixed age limits. And, and that gives a biased picture, a misleading picture. And I should say that in the book, the chapter on population aging, we actually introduced some of the new age measures that were developed at our institute, namely not only defining age as time since birth, but also an alternative definition. Uh, age is the time when the remaining life expectancy is 15 years or less. Or alternative, taking some health-based measures of how old you are. And that gives a very different picture of what is the age dependency. Now coming to uh, Francesco, the point that also was made in almost the same way by uh, David uh, is this question of what about the education differentials in highly developed uh, societies. I think we have to distinguish here, it's more the egalitarian developed societies that we're looking where, where like the Scandinavian countries in particular, where uh, female status is, has risen in the, uh, let's say, the southern European or some of the East Asian countries. Uh, we still see uh, that indeed more educated women uh, choose uh, smaller families or no children whatsoever. And maybe Stuart can say a few words about this later on. So in the book, we do discuss the issue. And uh, actually, the question is at the, at the low end of the demographic of the fertility transition, indeed, these uh, differentials almost disappear. And it depends on the country. In some countries, they are still there. In others, they disappear. That's another reason why we do need sort of country-specific expertise. We can't make the same assumption for all countries, because this is indeed very culture-dependent, and the status of women within families matters here. But I also should say the way we, we put it there, that when we look at the, the low end, sort of the end of the demographic transition, we really have to distinguish between desired family size and the ability to achieve this desire. And, and that explains also the upward trend for the best educated or richest women in these highly developed societies, that they often have a relatively high desired family size and manage better to arrange their lives in such a way to actually have the desired family size. So again, education, again, has this empowering effect to be a better able uh, to meet your desired family size. And that, of course, in a, low, in a high fertility setting, helps women to bring down their fertility to the lower desires. Now, the last point uh, that uh, David made, and uh, also Francesco in a somewhat different way, is this question, like, how much can we trust experts to, uh, to know what's in the future? The first is, of course, that in demography, we are in a privileged position. Uh, with respect, uh, comparison to many other disciplines, because the human lifespan now is 70, 80 years. And uh, so if we know how many 10-year-olds there are today, uh, we have a good analytical handle to projecting how many 60 years old there will be in 50 years, because these people are already born. And the more so, if we know how many, let's say, 20 years old with secondary education there are today, we have a pretty good handle on saying how many 60-year-old women uh, with a secondary education there will be in, in 40 years. So this is a, a, the length of the human life cycle helps us. And since much of the education is really concentrated in young ages and very little changes thereafter. There is this strong cohort effect. Uh, now, the, uh, as you've pointed at, and as it was said, that at the next Population Association of America meeting in San Diego in April, there will be a big debate session uh, among the, the UN, uh, who are now favoring an approach that is almost essentially based on statistical extrapolation. Uh, that is sort of the one extreme where uh, you only have the data and the model and don't really need the expertise of anybody in the room, any substantive thinking, any substantive analysis, at least for projections that is useless. And, and the other uh, extreme, so to say, that we had in the past is sort of naively asking one expert in the worst case, what is your opinion about the total fertility rate in 2030 or 2050? That's the way that many national statistical agencies are still doing it, and the UN has been doing it until recently. And the question is, how can we improve upon when experts have studied often for long periods, lots of data, and made their theories. 
how can we utilize this accumulated knowledge of the scientific community and translate it into something useful for projections. And that's sort of where we try to make an additional step, but not collecting expert opinion, uh, but having this uh, assessment of alternative arguments that then in consequence would lead into to higher and lower fertility and so on. I think I stop here, and we have. Thanks, all the gang. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. So now, now we've got an opportunity for some questions, and I think magically, uh, so this question here, magically, a uh, 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 microphone will come up to the front. So we'll take this question first. Uh, this this gentleman here. Sorry, no. The, uh, well, I was getting. It was yes, yeah. that, that that, and we will then come to this gentleman Sorry. here. And and could w when you're asking a question, could you very briefly introduce yourself so we know roughly where you're coming from? Please be relatively brief. Uh, Dr. Spelle for Environment Europe, ex-Environmental Change Institute. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, I was fortunate enough to return to Vienna last year, uh, where I worked you know, in 2004. Uh, and uh, after my lecture, I attended a, a talk by the author of Limits to Growth, uh, Dennis Meadows. And my question will be related to that work. I'm very interested about the larger feedback loops and uh, how, uh, you know, the work that you've been doing um, is connected to the, those sort of long-term tendencies. Because the interesting fact that was mentioned was that <coughs> according to the, some Australian uh, current research, the uh, actual statistical trends that we are experiencing at the global scale are very, very similar to the, you know, uh, the um, rather um, depressingly uh, sort of uh, collapsing scenario. From, from the limits to growth work of 40 years ago. Thank you. Should I respond quickly? Yes, I'm grateful for you to mentioning this uh, systems analytical approach because this has really been the, the founding idea of the Institute of the work of the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis where we indeed uh, look at the feedbacks. And uh, we are probably also one of the few population uh, for, uh, forecasting agencies who give explicit attention to this. Uh, we've done it in specific uh, models for specific countries where we, we model exactly uh, how uh, growth in population together with certain environmental changes may impact on uh, health, mortality, migration patterns and so on. And in this big uh, global expert uh, survey, we had large numbers, I think it must be more than 15 questions related to the possible impact of these different changes that we see that could feed back mostly we would assume on human health and survival, but also on migration and on, on fertility even. And we've tried to work this in. And in a, a conclusions chapter, we have a special section where we have some rather extreme scenarios where we assume that in a certain year, there would be a major famine, for instance, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the countries that grow the most rapid, a certain percentage of the population would die and then how, see how fast it would recover and what would follow. The problem with these disaster scenarios is that they are very arbitrary. We have no clue when and what kind of disaster and what strength would happen. But I, I think it's useful to at least demonstrate in specific cases what could be the consequence. Anyone else from the panel want to? I guess a question here, and then we'll go back. Thank you. <coughs> me. Um, I'm actually astonished that you are ignoring a factor which would wonderfully diversify your research to such a degree, I don't know whether you'd ever sort it out again. And that is spiritual reality. For the vast majority of people in the world today who are not educated, their spiritual reality is far more important than your material reality. It will cause them to make decisions which you would not find comprehensible. Um, that's a factor that I think you might look at I recently produced a typology of spiritual reality for children in schools in this country so that they could judge for themselves at what level, approximately, their parents have reached in understanding spiritual reality, which for them is real, and what level of spiritual reality they wish to experience themselves. Would you like to have a copy? <laughs> uh. I should say. Well, do no, 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 excuse me. No, 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 excuse me. We, need, we do need to keep things moving yeah, on. We uh, need to okay. keep things on. I just said that we, uh, we at the f in this round, focus on things that can be quite clearly measured. The factors that you uh, mention uh, may uh, matter, uh, but it's very difficult to get an analytical handle on them. Indeed, uh, Anne Goujon, my colleague here, has been very much involved in doing religion-specific population projections, so having a religious affiliation or even the intensity 
uh, of a religious practice uh, as part uh, dealt with. This is measured in surveys, and we can do a multidimensional population modeling with this. So maybe Anne can say a few words later. There's a question uh, about two thirds of the way back on just under the window, yeah. and then we'll take a question over there. Thank you, Matteo Ricciardi, INET, Toxon Martin School, and Nafil College. Uh, given the goal of increasing education, what do you think is the role of uh, public education with respect to private education? Thank you. And I think, I think it will be good. We'll take three questions and then we can. Uh, so, so there was one over there, yeah. And, and, then, and then we can see if there's more. Uh, I'm Jill Shankleman. Um, I'm a sort of consultant sociologist. Um, I wonder if you can say anything about particular cohorts and the relationship between education and all these good things that are assumed to follow from it. Because one of the things I notice, particularly throughout Africa, is what I'd call semi-educated men, finished primary or early secondary, are not getting themselves all those good benefits out of education because they're not getting jobs, they're not getting the income increase because of the changing in workforce. Uh, and they're not necessarily displaying these sort of positive values uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, the way in which they make decisions, democratic values and so on. They, tend this, they look to be often a very angry and disenfranchised group. And so I'm just querying how linear the relationship is between more education and all those good things. And one, th one last question in this group. Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Ron Labonte. I'm a professor at the University of Ottawa in Canada, but I'm here visiting um, with David Stuckler in the sociology department at the present time. Um, part of my, my question was actually um, posed by the last, by the last speaker. Um, and at, at times I feel with the topics that you're discussing right now, that I'm back in a public health conference, early child development, healthy aging, healthy life expectancy. But, but something that hasn't been talked about is uh, the current state in terms of global inequalities, um, ecological fragility, um, uh, and in a sense, the kind of the macroeconomic structures. There's an assumption that if people are educated, then they will actually get actively labor market participation. Um, but we also have evidence now that even in high income countries, the education dividend is, is eroding. Um, so uh, were any of those kind of considerations taken into account in the modeling exercises that you undertook? Thank you. So uh, any, we'll, we'll turn to Wolfgang in a minute, but any, any of the, the other three of you would like to say anything about any of these questions? Yeah, first on the, on the first question about private versus public education, I, I mean, we are not going into this. Uh, it's the organizational form of education. This is not a book about schooling, it's a book about the human capital, the outcome. Uh, but what is a clear case uh, that appears from all the, the studies is that there is a case for, for government efforts to expand education. I mean, we in, in Europe have uh, for long had uh, compulsory education up to a certain age in almost all the countries. Uh, but in many developing countries, there is no such compulsory education. Or the government is not providing enough education, whether through their own schools or um, allowing private schools to fill this is of secondary importance. But the, the main thing is this: there are so many important social externalities to education that there's a strong case uh, for governments pushing for more education. Uh, the other question about, uh, of course, uh, semi-educated, and it really depends on what you're looking at. Economists usually have sort of the job and the income in mind is the possibly the only positive consequence of education. But here we also look a lot in many other respects. We talked about health and, and, and about fertility. And I mean, for the health effects, there are some data from Africa that show that women, even if they go just for a year into a bad school where they don't even learn how to read and write, but they take something home mm -hmm. uh, that helps them to then have a lower infant mortality for their own children. Just the fact that they are somehow talking to adults, getting something back from adults. So even incomplete and bad schooling may help with some issues. And of course, for the health-related behavior, uh, this is more direct and possibly easier to achieve uh, than for finding a good job where the economic structure and, and the market and all these political conditions also play a role. And um, this is uh, sort of the answer to the, the th third question in a way that uh, 
of, of course, we all know that, yeah, particularly in Europe, also we have a huge increases of unemployment among the uh, educated young people, particularly in Southern Europe. But I just recently looked at the OECD uh, unemployment statistics, and in each of the countries still, the unemployment rate was higher for the less educated groups than for the better educated group. It's, it's not ideal, but at least education still these days uh, gets you something. Of course, if education is tremendously expensive, as it is in the United States, for some people that you pay a lot <coughs> for a phony education that may not bring you much, that's a different story. Hmm. Uh, other questions? <coughs> Question up here, one there, and one will take that, those two. Um, uh, so one tricky question is, of course, how technological change would affect this, both in terms of maybe making education much cheaper or various forms of cognitive enhancement allowing education to occur throughout lifespans or, of course, direct life extension effect. How did you take that into account or how did you handle that kind of uncertainty? Thanks, uh, Robert Tilliard. I'm reading for an MPhil in economic and social history and most recently worked at the G20. Um, I was just wondering what you think the real pressure points are um, coming out of your, your study in the world where demographics are changing significantly. And then maybe also any of, any of your results that you found surprising or unintuitive um, when you reached your conclusions. Well, on this lifelong learning issue, the answer is very simple. This is sort of the first attempt to introduce educational attainment uh, into population projections. And uh, we take the, pos the simplest possible way, namely having the highest educational attainment in terms of formal education. Only these uh, six categories ranging from no education to post-secondary. And we have neither the quality of education, no continued education of honor. These are all important and they matter but that will be left for future work. I mean, we at least, but it's a, a step to have at least this very simple thing. And maybe this uh, second question I should pass on to other members of the, the panel if uh, you're this sort of, I mean, surprises, um, uh, I mean, sometimes uh, you are surprised, of course, if a certain trend, if it is kept constant until the end of the century will result in a, in a huge um, population growth, but I mean, we have uh, done so many simulation rounds and back and forth that in a way, so if we know quite well the system that we are modeling and there weren't any surprise. I'm not sure what exactly you meant by pressure points. I mean, the, the one thing, and maybe then I should really ask Stuart to say a few words, is this ultra low fertility in, in Asia. Uh, where in, in, in Hong Kong it, it's around one child per woman and in the cities of China, Shanghai, I think it's even below one. Sort of if this get, carries on for, for long periods, there will of course be tremendous discontinuity. Do you want to say a few words to this? Um, no, I, I can do, yeah. Um, I think that one of the interesting things that came out of our, oh, hello, thanks. Um, one of the interesting things that came out of our chapter was this, the idea of, um, I wouldn't necessarily go as far as a pressure point. So I'm in social policy, we don't like pressure points. Um, <laughs> uh, but a, a, of, an, of a kind of a moving, a movement of the, the locus of low fertility, rapid aging um, from what we traditionally think of as being a European phenomenon to if we're looking at global numbers of this, this is really an East Asian and increasingly a Southeast Asian um, phenomenon. And where we see um, major um, differences is um, for, for example, in terms of fertility preferences, that we know that in Europe there is generally a solid two-child norm. Um, most people have a stated aim of having, uh, of, of having around two children. But increasingly in East Asia and, and, and in China in particular, we're seeing the normalization of sub-replacement uh, fertility preferences. And what I think that can, the, the, that can mean in the long term is it means that the space for policy to be able to, you know, for family policies um, to be able to work, uh, if we see um, um, family policies interacting with ameliorating the pressure to do with childbearing, if there's not that latent desire or uh, unmet need for childbearing, 
as we increasingly we seem to be seeing in East Asia, in parts of East Asia and Southeast Asia as well, uh, then the room for those uh, the, for those policies to work is obviously much uh, smaller. So I think it would be the movement, uh, in my view at least, the movement of um, that, that low, very low fertility, <coughs> uh, very rapid aging locusts from uh, from Europe to Asia. Sarah, do you want to? Yes, thank you. I, and in fact, I, what I'm going to pick up on, actually, to a certain extent, Stuart has raised it, and, and it was the question around education. And I think around, in particular, the interaction between education and culture and what is happening in sub-Saharan Africa. Because uh, we, if, if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, we have countries there which at the national level, although there is obviously intra-country variation, uh, their total fertility rate is above four, so it's between four and seven. And just as Stuart was saying, we have for many years taken on board this idea of the two-child norm. We now see that, in particular in East Asia, and there is some argument that, that in some parts maybe of Central Europe, we're seeing the normalization of a one-child norm. But we, it, I think we're still unclear of what is the norm in many African societies. The, these societies differ, but some people are beginning to argue that maybe culturally, it may be a three or four child, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the two child that we've seen in Asia uh, and in Europe. Uh, and I think also that th there was an interesting question about the relationship between education and, too, in a way, too little education. Uh, and definitely one of the things that at the macro level Wolfgang's work has shown is the importance of tertiary education. But there is also evidence, and again, I'm just thinking of the work we're doing at the Institute around the stalling of the fertility transition in some of these sub-Saharan African countries, where again, at the, at the national level, we are seeing uh, a fertility coming down, the total fertility rate, the number of children uh, per woman coming down, and then getting stuck at, uh, you know, around about four. Kenya, for example, seems to be stuck. Some of the other countries uh, are stuck. And we are also, when we look at it at um, a sort of qualitative level, at the micro level, looking at household decisions, we're seeing women who have uh, education, and if you like, they, they are using their children to manipulate the system. And just to give you an example, uh, things around understanding that if they have four children, then three of those children may well migrate and send back remittances. Uh, and beginning to think, actually, in, 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 a, in an educated way of how they can use children as some kind of a sort of consumption asset. So I think in some parts of the world, we, we really do not understand uh, the role of a lot of those cultural variables, like some preference, for example, uh, and the impact that has, and how that then interrelates with this growing uh, uh, level of education. So, so it, I think it is complex. Uh, and we may see these national figures, the macro figures, but underneath it, there are still some very complex sort of household decisions going on. Yeah, ma maybe you have a general point. I think th this, uh, what, what uh, Yaza has been doing now, the Wittgenstein Center has been doing is very important because we need, let's say, independent uh, science-based evidence for uh, discussing policies around population. And I'm afraid this independence hasn't been around in many cases uh, in, in population forecasting. Uh, national forecasting agencies are, in most cases, uh, government-based agencies. They are not really even free to choose the scenarios they, are, they have to work on. And it's, it's amazing how sometimes this kind of scenarios have, have been accepted in a very a critical way and sometimes they are explicitly driven by uh, the need to raise some of the issues uh, if if we take one of the uh, one of the figures that have been uh, published uh, on, on the science article uh, using the UN world population forecast there is a there is clearly a, a very big crisis scenario where uh, for Nigeria, two billion uh, inhabitants are not considered uh, out of uh, bounds in terms of prediction. Uh, I'm not sure that's not also driven by policy agenda. So I would like to, uh, to have more of this kind of exercises and a competition uh, among uh, sci scientific um, agencies or independent agencies working on what is population today and where population is uh, going. I think we've got time for one last set of questions, if there are any 
answers to one there something here. <coughs> Daniel Shaw from the planner that's town and not family <laughs> does migration have any impact on fertility and is it measurable if somebody moves from their home country to an away country do different populations increase or reduce their fertility maybe Francesco and uh, David should answer this question <laughs> Yeah, okay. Yes, indeed, in, it, it, does, it does so in, in, in both directions. The, the process of uh, um, um, the sequence of, of activity uh, in women who are migrating um, is distorted a bit, it is usually believed. Uh, women who are um, likely to move from a poor country to a rich country, and that, that, that's where most of the interest lies, um, are, are thought to postpone having their births uh, until they can move to uh, or at least their, their next birth anyway, until they can move to, to their richer country or destination. Um, because, of course, it, uh, uh, it has certain benefits there, certain health and welfare benefits uh, in, in terms of medical care, possibly um, in, in terms of establishing, establishing <laughs> citizenship, uh, as was the case in, in the Republic of Ireland uh, for, for, for some time. Um, this tends to distort the pattern of fertility in a way which also distorts its measurement. Um, and that uh, often yields a somewhat higher measure of, of fertility among immigrant women than, than is justified by the eventual outturn in terms of a completed family. Um, that being said, uh, it's normally the case, as you might imagine, that when people are moving from, uh, from a, um, a country with a, with a high fertility regime, a poor one, into a rich country with a low fertility regime, then uh, they will bring their uh, high fertility regime with them. And although that tends to erode over time, uh, both across generations and also even within, the, even within the lifetime of the women themselves, nonetheless, on the whole, it puts, puts the birth rate up. If you look at the uh, the total fertility of European countries uh, and try to, uh, to tease out the migration effect, then um, typically it, it adds 0 0.1, 0 0.15 to the TFR. So a country uh, which, which le left with its own resources, as it were, would have a TFR of 1.7, might have one of 1.8, 1.85. That, that's the calculation which is normal across European countries. Um, uh, and so, as, as Wolfgang's uh, review pointed out, one of the, the reasons why the, uh, the experts and the meta-experts expect that uh, one of the driving, upward driving forces of, of migration, uh, of uh, fertility in rich countries, uh, is going to be migration from poorer ones. And that will continue for as long as um, those fertility regimes in poorer countries are, are higher than in richer ones, and that's going to be for a very long time. Thank you, David. Francesca, can you you know, I, I don't think I have much to add. The only, perhaps the only point that we have to take into account if you look at this debate is that now there are many migration flows that happen coming from lower fertility areas, especially in this country, for instance. Most migrants come from countries that have lower fertility than the UK, and that's a completely new phenomenon. It, will, it has never been like that in the past, and it, this may change completely the way we look at the migration fertility nexus. So for our information, Poland, Romania, the, China, these are all countries with lower fertility than the UK. But uh, with respect, um, six or seven, no, 70 percent of, of migrants to the UK come from the third world not from Eastern Europe, and furthermore, uh, the, the TFRs of Eastern European migrants in Britain are considerably higher than the national average. Um, over two, uh, some say over three in some oh, cases. because they are distorted, as you just said Even before. So, yeah. I, I, that, I, I, don't think, I don't think that's the entire reason. We don't yet know, but one of the reasons may be that the factors which suppress fertility in, in the countries from which they come, uh, the poverty, the, the policy uncertainty, um, the all, all sorts of difficulties, including um, health and medical ones, are, are relieved in Britain, um, where they move into a high welfare environment, which is of a non-contributory nature, um, and um, uh, many of the obstacles which you mentioned were, were, uh, had to be removed in order to um, uh, realize high fertility are thereby removed by the process of migration. It's further complicated by the fact that in uh, migrants from Slovakia and the Czech Republic um, and Romania especially, there's a high proportion of, of, of uh, a, high, a higher proportion than we're used to of uh, Roma gypsies um, who in their homelands have a considerably higher birth rate there and doubtless have so here as well. Wolfgang, do you want a last word on all of this? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to put it back into the, the perspective. Uh, on the global level in migration, we had uh, lengthy discussions 
uh, that uh, whether we, I mean, for the next decades, we are just sort of continuing the currently observed migration regime uh, into the, the future. Uh, we've estimated a global level migration matrix uh, between individual countries. So this is the first attempt that uh, two of our colleagues, uh, Guy Abel and uh, Nicola Sander have published this. Uh, with really sort of the in and out migration flows. And so we keep the in and out migration rates constant for the coming decades. But in the longer term future, it is really very hard to see whether the pattern, for instance, under conditions of climate change uh, will dramatically change. What about uh, vast uh, Siberia being empty and being warmer under climate change? Will that be a, an area attracting migrants? We don't know and what the political ramifications of this will be. But we may well see uh, over time a, a change in the distribution of migration streams and this makes it very, very hard. Uh, so it's not only the volume uh, but also the direction of flows that is uh, open and that makes it a bit harder than even the uh, mortality and fertility assumptions, which are difficult enough in themselves. And maybe just, just, just uh, the last word that we, we, I mean, the subtitle of all my past books on the future population was always, what can we assume today? It's really from today's perspective, from the published knowledge today. Uh, but of course, things can happen tomorrow that let us look for the, into the future uh, with different classes in a different way that can never be ruled out. So. Thank you for sharing this interesting discussion. Thank you, Wolfgang. And on that happy note of um, the prospect that being sent to Siberia might one day become a, uh, <laughs> might one, one day be something to look forward to, let's thank Wolfgang and David and Francesco and Sarah. <laughs> and perhaps a happier note still, uh, there's a drinks reception next door to which everybody is uh, invited. So I hope to see you there in a moment. Not, 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 not all very good stuff, Bob. Congratulations again. Thank you.